kind of reverence for God's word. And let's read this together this morning. The 23rd Psalm. Would you read, read with me? Ready? The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside still waters. He's my strength. He guides me along the right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Father, now as we go to your word, I pray that you would not only open our ears, but open our hearts. Let us be receptive to what you are going to speak. Lord, let it not be my voice that is heard from this podium today, but let the Spirit of God now speak for me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in your sight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, God bless you. Be seated this morning. The King James is how I started my notes in, and of course I love reading the NLT, and that's the version that I tend to use for my own personal study at home, just because it's so simple, it's so clear, it speaks. But I really like how the King James puts the part of the passage that we're going to look at today. And we've all memorized the 23rd, well, most of us have. We've learned it in school even growing up. And, and we learn this part. It says, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And I want to talk to you today about walking in a rut. Anybody ever been there? And maybe by the time that I finish here today, you're going to find out that walking in a rut <coughs> is not such a bad thing. It's not what we enjoy. It's not as scenic. It's not as pretty. It's not as nice as being up on top of the summit and seeing down in the valley and seeing everything. But walking in a rut is actually a good thing. Let's review a little bit. We started Psalm 23 by talking about the only the benefits of Psalm 23 only apply to those who first go to Psalm 22. Some, the, the, the trilogy of Psalms, 22, 23, and 24, they are about Christ and the work that he would do. In Psalm 22, we see Jesus on the cross, high and lifted up, dying and paying the price for mankind's sin. In Psalm 23, we see the living Savior, the shepherd who is no longer hanging on a cross dying and no longer in a tomb dead, but we see a Savior who walks with his sheep daily and guides them from here to there. And in Psalm 24, we see that great promise fulfilled, that great hope that we have that now we see through a glass darkly, but one day we're going to see him face to face in all of his glory. And you see, in order to get to the benefits of Psalm 23, to that good shepherd part, we have to first go to that symbol of death, to the cross. We can't get to 23 without getting to 22. We want to. We'd rather skip that whole dying part just to get to the life. But God says, if you're going to live for me, you must first die for me. Just as he first died for us so that we could live. Then we begin going through the various, the, the first part of that, of that 23rd Psalm. And it started off with, the Lord is my shepherd. But first of all, we learned that he is, not that he was and not that he will be, but that he is today. And that we have the confidence of knowing that the Lord is a very present help in time of trouble. When we need him, he is right there. That we don't have to sit there and hunt for him. We don't have to look for him. If we've made him our Lord, if we've been to the cross, if we've made him Savior and Lord of our lives, he is also going to be right there. It's not that he was my shepherd and not that he will be, although both of those statements are true. The other good thing that we learned from that very first line was that he's mine. He belongs to me. That verse we quoted in a, a while ago, John 1, 11, that to as many as received him and accepted him, to them gave he the right to be called the children of God. You see, he's my shepherd. He's not
not just the shepherd of the world. He's not just the savior of the world. He's mine. He's Chris's. He's Monica's. He's Natasha's. When you claim him, not only do you get to say he's mine, but then he in turn says, she's mine. He's mine. There's a personal relationship which is established. Don't get me going on that. It's not my sermon. I'll get too excited and won't get through the floor. Then we learn that he makes us to lie down in green pastures, and we started talking about those stubborn, smelly, kind of pig-headed little farm animals called sheep that the Lord says we are. Bad. So we all remind me of some of those sheep. And you see, we said that sheep will not lie down until they've had their fill. And so what that verse says is, not only is he my shepherd, but he satisfies. He satisfied that the world is looking for the answers all over the place. Yesterday, as we were out in that teeming mass of people, there were people looking all over the place. There was a booth across the way from us that asked an atheist. I don't know what you would ask an atheist, but there's people, and some people would look there, that they have to look within themselves. Some people look to other gods, to other things. They look to their addictions. They look for the affirmation of people, but only Jesus satisfies. He says he makes me to lie down in green pastures, and he leads me to the still waters because he knows that sheep are terrified of rushing, raging water, and they won't drink from stagnant water. So he provides. Not only does he satisfy, but just what it is that I need and just the way I like it. He makes sure to get it for me. That's a good shepherd. Amen. That's a good shepherd. Last week, I stepped on your toes a little bit when we talked about how he restores our soul. How the, the sheep, every now and then, they'll get themselves in a comfortable spot. They'll lay down. And before long, because of their the center of gravity, they end up on their backs, and they're just like little bugs. If their feet can't hit the floor, they can't turn themselves back upright again. And so the shepherd, when he is called restoring a sheep, the shepherd goes and counts the sheep. And if there's one missing, he goes and finds the sheep and gently sets it back on its legs, massages its legs to get the circulation going again, and sends it back into the fold. He restores my soul. But today I want to talk to you about he leads me in paths of righteousness. I'm going to try to give you a couple of really, I don't know how deep they are, but I think they're pretty good things. Let's think about these sheep again. You see, sheep are pretty much the domesticated animal that needs the absolute most care. Cows don't need this kind of care. Pigs don't need this kind of care. Even goats don't need this kind of care. But he called us sheep for a reason. That's because sheep are needy. Sheep need a shepherd. Now, I'm pretty sure the sheep in the back of its mind sometimes thinks, I don't know why that guy keeps pushing me to go all over the place, because I think I know that. I know there ain't none of you in here like that. Don't be all self-righteous and holy on me. You see, sheep are notoriously habitual. They're also notoriously stubborn and self-destructive. Do you know any people like this? You see, if sheep are left to themselves, sheep which are not managed, sheep which have no shepherd, will continuously graze from the same plot of ground until they have turned it into a wasteland. And they will not move on their own. They find a nice pasture, and they will graze the heck out of it. They will pull the roots up, and because they keep staying there, of course, they also relieve themselves there which means that they're now prone to getting all the diseases and the parasites that they get because they're eating in the same place where they're doing the other stuff. <laughs> I'm not going to go into too many details there. You can fill in the blanks. You see, the sheep like the ground, but the shepherd makes them keep moving. I'm sure they don't understand that there's parasites and disease and muck and mire. Well, I like this ground. This grass tastes good. I've been grazing here. Anybody know people like that? Okay. You see, 
They also have terrible eyesight. Did you know that? Sheep can't see worth what? They can't see nothing. They're about blind in the back. You know how they know where to go? They listen. Now, they'll see vague movements, and they kind of recognize that kind of round shape of other sheep. And so they just kind of look, and they listen for that, and that's where they run off to. They also hear the voice of a shepherd, and that's how they're led. We get into that this morning. A couple of points as we start. Who wants to be managed? Who really wants somebody to come around all the time, tell them, do this? And my job, you know, working for the great American cooking company. Yay, what a wonderful job. Press <laughs> God, I got it. Those cookies are delicious. Hey, I get to eat all the free cookies I want, so that's not a bad deal there if you ask me. Uh, I, get, I have the opportunity, I drive and drive from store to store and go and check on them. And then every now and then they see me coming. I, I know I, on, on Mother's Day, a lot of folks think I don't work on Sundays, but I actually do sometimes. And I drove to the store furthest out, down in Lake Jackson on Sunday afternoon. I walked in the door and the eyes of the kids in that store got so big. What are you doing here? I work here. <laughs> And they didn't like the fact that I was there to check up on. And immediately I said, oh, we got to fix this. we got to fix that. we got to fix this. This isn't right. you got to do that. The cookie police had shown up. <laughs> people don't want people to tell them that they're doing it wrong or that there's a better way to do it. Because inherently, the reason they were doing it the way they were doing it is because they thought that their way was better. Right. You see, it's not our nature to have anyone else that's called anyone else's name. It's not our nature to have someone else call the shots. Isaiah 53, 6 says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Every one of us. There's a reason the Lord called us sheep, because sheep notoriously want to kind of go do their thing the way they want to go do it. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way which seems right to a man. But what is the end thereof? Destruction. And just like a sheep that does not have a shepherd, just like a sheep that doesn't listen to its shepherd, we too, if we do not listen to our shepherd, and if we do not go where he leads us, the way may seem right to us, but the end of it is destruction. Not quite where we want to go. There's a book I've been reading called The Shepherd's Look at Psalm 23. Great book, and I forgot to write the, the author's name down. But he has this great quote that I wrote. It says, the stubborn, self-willed, proud, self-sufficient sheep that persists in pursuing its old paths and in grazing in its own polluted ground will in the end become a bag of bones on ruined land. And boy, we know people who are just like that. JR's, VRB, South Beach, and whatever other places out there are, were filled with so many people grazing the same ground over and over, wondering, why can I not lie down? I am not satisfied. I'm still hunting. I'm still looking. In the words of the, the pop song, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Look with me at a couple of things in this passage. He leads me, this, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The first thing is, he leads me. And in order for him to lead us anywhere, it means that there needs to be some movement. You can't be led sitting still. Now see, we talked about last week about getting comfortable, right? And that's our nature. And sheep, you know, they're also kind of lazy. Excuse me here. The sheep tend to be a little lazy, and after a while, after they've had their fill, they just want to lie down, and they want to just rest and relax. And isn't that the way that we are a lot of times? We want to sit, we want to relax, we want to be comfortable. And the shepherd says, no, 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 it's time to go. It's time to keep moving. And let me tell you, the, the children of Israel were in this lesson very well too. When they came out of Egypt on their way to the promised land, they had to follow a pillar of fire by day. I'm sorry, a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. And when the cloud moved, they better go with it. It wasn't that they needed to go take a board meeting and have a boat and see if they was going to follow. It was either follow or die. Because you can't stay in the desert.
desert and expect to live. And so when the cloud moved, it was dependent on them to sin, go and then go. If they stood still and God moved forward, they were backslidden by the fall. Because the distance between them and God became greater and greater and greater. And in your life, God many times, not many times, all the time, is calling you to progress forward in your walk with him. And if you are still in the same place where you were five years ago, ten years ago, that's great. But he's moved on. And it's time for you to go ahead, unpack your tent, and start moving. And get with the program and go where God is sending you. You see, too many are still stuck on old ground. Well, it's the way we always did it, Brother Chris. I remember when I grew up at my old church. This is how we did it. Let me give you news flash. Are you listening? This is not your old church. This ain't yesterday anymore. It's a new day. As a matter of fact, the, one of the very first passages we looked at when, when we started the Gateway of Hope was, Behold, I do a new thing. Even now it springs forth. Look, you silly sheep. Don't you see it? I like this graph. It's good. I remember people, when I first heard we worshiped my old church, and we would pull out some new songs, and people would look back. But I like the old song. I like them too. But it's okay to go ahead and progress and to move forward. All right, now. We overgraze the same ground over and over. We're still stuck on the same revelation. Jesus loves me. Well, good. I'm glad you got that. Paul says it's time to move past the milk and start going on to some meat. All right. See, spiritually, too many are grazing on old pasture and eventually they die because all the nutritious stuff is gone. There's no new revelation. There's no new pasture ground that's being, that's being brought up for the sheep. But then there's another part to this. He leads me. Who's leading? Who? He is. You know, a lot of folks want the pastor to lead. Okay, I'm just going to go. Y'all have to shut me down because I know I, I've listened to some of y'all. They want the pastor to lead. Or they want the church to lead. They want some TV preacher to lead them. I was listening. I, I, that was, it, was, it was great because I was listening to, uh, we were in the car on the way into church this morning, and Joel Olstein was preaching. I don't get to hear Joel too often, uh, but just happened to come across, and I thought, well, look at that. That's man. He's preaching my sermon for him. <laughs> Bless God. He must have been listening to the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And he said, he says, uh, he says, you know, folks have come up to me many times. There was this, there was this guy in his church, another minister on staff there at Lakewood, who, uh, <coughs> who was very talented apparently, and his brother in the church came up to him and said, oh, I just have a word from the Lord. And he started to tell this guy, told this other minister in the church how he was supposed to go off and start a new church and how, he, how the, the end, it would just be great. Well, then week after week, this brother would come up to him and say, well, now, brother, when are you going to obey God? When are you going to go? And finally, this minister looked at him and says, well, just let me ask you a quick question. Are you going to find me an auditorium and rent it out for me? Are you going to go ahead and get me the sound system and the sound equipment? Are you going to go ahead and pay for the advertising? And the guy said, oh, no, no. I, well, I don't got the money for that. He said, well, see, when the Lord calls, he provides. Now, God hadn't called me to do that. You're calling me to do that, so therefore, you need to provide. He never bothered him again. You see, we are waiting sometimes for people to give us some word, but around here, we believe in the doctrine of the priesthood of the believer. The word of God in 1 Timothy says that there is now one mediator between God and man, and that is the man Christ Jesus. I don't need to go in a confessional to go confess my sin before a priest in order to be absolved. I can simply go before the throne of grace and say, Father, forgive me. But in the same way, Hebrews says that I have a great high priest who is touched by the feeling of my infirmity and that when I call on his name, when I bring my need before him, it's not that he has a deaf ear and he's not going to listen. It's not that his hand's so short that it can't reach. No, instead he says, come with confidence. Bring your petitions and your needs before me and I'll answer you. He leads. 
It's lazy Christianity to expect your pastor or your church or your denomination to lead for you. So sheep, stop being lazy. I'll pray for you, and folks, I count an honor to pray for you. But when I come to give you a word from the Lord, it should be a confirmation of what God has already spoken to you, not some new deep revelation. How do the sheep follow the shepherd? They hear. They can't see him. They can hear him. Sheep are gone. What did Jesus say about the sheep? My sheep know my voice. And another voice they will not talk. And you, my friend, if you are a child of God, then you need to learn how to hear the shepherd's voice. Now, at first, when you first become one of his sheep, it might be a little tough for you to distinguish what his voice sounds like. Now, do you know how you will get used to his voice? Hang around with him. Be in his presence. When I first met Chris, I, if he'd come up and talk to me later on, I probably wouldn't have recognized him. Somebody called me up. I had somebody call me one day, and this person had called me in a long time. You ever get one of those phone calls, and the number's not saved, and they just start talking to you? Just like, blah, 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 blah. It's worse than them meeting you on the street, because they got your phone number. <laughs> It's embarrassing enough when they come to you at the street and you're trying to talk to them and you know they know you and you have no clue on earth. You couldn't distinguish them from Adam. Now this guy's calling me on the phone. It took me a good five minutes, but then he said to me, there was a little drawl in his voice. He said, Rick Walker. And I recognized him right away and I was, why? Because I remembered his voice. And when the shepherd begins to speak and you get used to hearing his voice, he's going to say, come on. And you go. You know, when you, it, it, it really requires that element of trust. The sheep's going to have to follow the shepherd a little while. At the beginning, the little sheep probably is more prone to call. Yeah, it's okay. I'll stick to the side. I'll do what I'm going to do. And after a while, the sheep begins to learn. Oh, maybe he knows what he's talking about. What, who are you allowing to lead you? The pastor, the church, your tradition? How does he lead? The word lead in the Hebrew it means to push, to influence. When we did a study uh, uh, about a year and a half ago on the idea of the spirit-led church or the spirit-filled church, which the, the word in the New Testament, led and filled, it actually is the same Greek word. It means the same thing. We have this idea of being led by the spirit of the Lord coming and the Lord grabbing you by the hand and going, Come with me, that's how he's dragging us down the street. He's just leading us all the way. Yeah, sorry, folks. It's all right. <laughs> that's the idea we get, right? That's the idea. He's leading us. He's, he's like grandma, grabbing you by the ear and he's just pulling you along. That's not it at all. The idea in the New Testament is we have a giant sail and the wind comes and fills the sail and pushes it and moves it in the direction it's supposed to go. That's good. Now, somebody's going to grab a hold of that. And the, the light might come on later on, but that's okay. I hope it does. When the Lord comes, He pushes you. He influences you. He nudges you. He doesn't grab you. You have free will. You can be stubborn like a goat or a mule if you want. Dig your heels in and say, I shall not be. I shall not be moved. Or you can say, all right, well, if the wind is pushing, let's go. There's a good thing about the wind pushing you along. It's a little easier to walk when there's a wind that you're about. You ever notice that? All right. That was a freebie, by the way. You see, the concept of the spirit of the church is that he influences us, not that he drags us. The other thing the shepherd does for the sheep, because he knows they're going to overgraze the ground, and so he constantly, while the sheep are resting, he goes and he looks at the next pasture and he makes sure it's all good. So the concept, the good idea that I got, the good thing that I know, Ken, this is good. When he's going to lead me to the next place, he's already there. This is good ground. I think, oh, Pastor, this is the quietest Pentecostal church I've ever preached. <laughs> he leads us by his voice into a place that he has already prepared for us. So what does he, in what does he lead us? In paths of righteousness. Amen. 
That word paths means ruts. You see, if you go to the if you go to the Middle East where they still do a whole lot of sheep herding, you go up on those steps and those sides of those of those hills, you're gonna see little paths which have been dug out. You know who digs those paths? The shepherd digs them out. Why? Because the sheep are blind. And so the shepherd takes great care to go ahead and he digs a whole lot out. That way as the sheep is going along, the shepherd's behind. That sheep up in the front especially, okay, would be me right now. That sheep up in the front, he probably wants to go looking off on some other things too. That sheep on the on the front there, because all them, the other sheep are going to follow. That's what sheep do. They follow each other. The shepherd's back behind them pushing. Go, go, go. And the one in the very front, the one in the front might not be able to hear his voice as clearly, but it's got a rut it's walking in. He can feel the ground around it. Now, the scenery ain't that pretty. There ain't no grass for it to eat because it's all been dug up. Because the Lord didn't mean for you to stop there and eat. The Lord meant for you to keep on moving. You know, the thing that just absolutely sometimes drives me crazy, especially about Pentecostal people, is they get filled with the Holy Ghost. They love the upper room so much that they never want to leave. They just stay up in the upper room. Here's my cup, Lord. Lift it up, Lord. Oh, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me. And the sheep just gets fat and stubborn. The sheep gets bloated up. You know, gluttony is still one of the deadly sins. Spiritual gluttony is the same way. When I read the New Testament, when they went up in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, when they, when they got filled with the Holy Ghost, they didn't stay there. And they didn't go back. They went from there out among the people. See, the Lord leads us in a rut. Might not be enjoyable. It's not for you to enjoy. It's for you to get from point A to point B. Keep walking. One foot in front of the other, Sharon. I know it's tough for you sometimes. One foot in front of the other. The law of motion says it's easier to stay in motion than to stop and start again. So keep moving. Because if you stop, the sheep behind will run and stop too. And don't be fooled. There are people who follow you. You might not be the guy that stands up behind the pulpit. You might not be the guy who gets to have the live light of sing on a platform or playing a keyboard or doing any of these things. But people follow you. And they see you. It leads me in paths. Ruts are for the sheep's good, though they deprive them of good grazing ground. But there's a certain kind of path he leads us on. It's the path the shepherd dug. It's a path of righteousness. I got a wonderful email this week from a lady back at my home church in Pasadena. At first, I was like, oh boy, because it started off with, Sven, are you gay? Uh-oh. Well, I figured honesty is the best policy, and so I said, well, yes, and she and I began to talk about, well, is this why Gateway of Hope started? I said, well, it's not just for gay, but that's a, that is a part of it. And she says, that's good. We're so believing for you. We're praying for you. This is a community that, that needs to hear the gospel. And she said, but let me ask you a question. Do you preach both sides of the cross or just the one? I said, well, what part do you mean? She says, true love is that, yes, he came and he died. But true love on the part of the sheep requires for them to surrender that cross. Do you preach deliverance from sin? Do you, do you preach righteous living? And let me tell you something, folks. We can talk about acceptance all the day long. And that is great, and that is very important. Yes. And grace is how we are saved, and grace is how we come to know Christ. True love was shown to us at the cross, Thank but Paul you. says true love compels us yes. to serve him. Yes. Yes. That means, I'll just be very clear, you cannot live in a life of sin and claim to be walking in paths of righteousness. Holiness. 
unto the Lord is the standard that he expects. Now, oh, you might be saying, well, Brother Span, give me the list. No, 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 no. See, this comes back to who are you following? Me or the shepherd? Let the shepherd tell you what's good and what's not. His book is clear. And if you gotta ask, maybe, just maybe, you shouldn't do it. You see, the Holy Spirit is that still, small voice. He confirms. Brother Osteen again this morning in his sermon said that, that there, was a, there was a man who came up to his daddy uh, while, he was, while he was still around and went up to Brother John and said, uh, he says, well, I, I think the Lord might be calling me to go to Africa. What do you think? Brother Osteen looked at him and said, well, I don't know. But if you go, you ought to take him with you so you'll know when to come back home. <laughs> Much better just to hear it for yourself. Listen and walk in righteousness. Why? Because the sheep behind you are watching the path you're walking. There will be detours where other sheep have gone off. Be real easy to follow. Stay in your rut. Follow the path that you've been assigned. Because the other path does not lead to a green pasture. The other path leads back to a pasture that's been grazed upon, a pasture filled with disease, a pasture full of wasteland. Walk the right path, and you'll get to the right place. I know that's a deep, deep thought. Sin is strength from those paths. And finally, you see a turning point in this song. Up to this point, we've seen the little sheep standing by the side of the fence, talking to the other sheep on the other side. Oh, my shepherd, he's so wonderful. And talking about the benefits to the sheep, how good it is to be a sheep in this pasture, how good it is to have this shepherd. Don't you want to follow this shepherd too? The little sheep say. And it's talking about all the benefits it gets. He satisfies me. He gives me what I need. He leads me. Well, he even restores me when I walk astray. He leads me on, on these paths over to good pasture. But then he changes, and suddenly it's no longer about the benefit of the sheep. He says, and he does it for his fits. You see, there is a progression here that we see in this song that God is calling people to maturity. He's calling you to grow up spiritually. Again, I've seen so many people, they get saved, and that is the depth of their spiritual understanding. God loves me. Jesus came to die for me, and he saved me, and that's it. They progress no further. Will they make it to heaven? Yeah. But boy, they are missing out on an abundant life in that time. You see, the reason he saved you is not for your name's sake. My name's sake ain't, my name ain't worth it is for my name can't save anybody. The name of this church can't save anybody. It's his name. Oh, yeah. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, oh, yeah. I draw men to oh, yeah. Well, how is he lifted up? In you, yeah. in you, yeah. in you, in you. Oh, in you. Yeah. The reason you are to walk in paths of righteousness, the reason that you should continue to desire to live a holy life, it's not that you have fire insurance and escape hell. The cross took care of that. Psalm 22 covered that. The reason that you should live righteous lives is so that others will not end up in hell. Because they're following you. Oh, Lord, I'm stepping on those here today. You see, all benefit has been for the sheep up to this point. Now it's for the shepherd. It's that I, in some way, could bring glory to his name. He's not glorified by what we do for him. He's glorified by what he's done in us. And now, in turn, we return that to him. And we say, Lord, as best as we can, as good in our own feeble little efforts, we're going to offer up lives to you. And we're going to say, Lord, use me. Isaiah, the sixth chapter, one of the most beautiful passages. The ninth verse, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? The Lord speaking. 
and Isaiah says, Here am I. Send me. And this morning, I believe the shepherd is speaking in this church service this morning. You are not here by accident, my friend. It was ordained before the foundation of the world was laid that you would be sitting in one of these seats this morning. And the shepherd this morning is saying, walk your rut and stay in it because I'm leading you to a better place. And there's a whole bunch of folks behind you. For me, will you do it for me? Not for you to be saved. That's taken care of if you've accepted me. But will you do it so that others will know. Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus, and I thank you that, Lord, today your word brings life. And Father, this has been a hard message to preach. The Lord is a message, a timely word the church needs to understand. Lord, I thank you that your love for us is deep. It is one. It is amazing. Lord, you are now calling us as sheep to return that love to you and to walk faithfully one foot in front of the other, to continue to move forward into the things that you have for us. Lord, this morning, would you touch men and women in this peace? Would you deal with hearts and lives? Would you keep your head bowed and your eyes closed for just a moment in this room this morning? I want you to look and take a personal inventory in your own life and in your own heart this morning. You see, this sermon wasn't for the person sitting next to you or on the row behind or in front of you. This message this morning was the Spirit of God speaking to you. And this morning he's asking you, are you willing to walk the path that I've laid out for you? Are you willing to stay on the run? For some folks in this room this morning, you're going to have to make the decision to let him lead and for you to relinquish your leadership post in your life. And if this morning, if you'll surrender to him, he will lead you and he'll never fail you. This morning, there's some other folks here today who have just simply gotten a little bit tired along the path. Has seemed like a rut and they're not enjoying it. They felt what happened to me enjoying the journey. And the Lord's saying, are you willing this morning to continue walking the rut that I've laid out for you fully, knowing that I've prepared this path and I'm taking you to good ground? Some folks here this morning who just simply need to say, Lord, give me strength to put one foot in front of the other. Father, this morning, there's some folks here today who need to simply come to a point where they're willing to say, Lord, maybe I've strayed from the path because I haven't been walking righteously. And Lord, I want to come back and I want to walk this path for your days to bring you honor. If that's you this morning in this room, if any of those apply to you, would you lift your hand this morning in this place? That's me, Pastor Spence. That's me. I need to do that this morning. That's where I'm at today. Amen. This morning, I want to pray with you. And there's some folks around here who would love to come in honor and pray with you. Would you stand with us this morning in this place? And if this morning... You are in that place and you're willing to make those commitments. One of those, would you come and meet us up here at this altar? And we would count it a privilege and an honor to pray for you this morning and to help pray you through to walk it on that right path. Would you stand with me this morning? And as we sing this song, would you come? Would you come this morning?
without.